Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Branko Glišić. I'm coming from Princeton University. I'll be talking about structural health monitoring based on long age and distributed strain sensors. So my talk will be a little bit more technical. We'll have a lot of diagrams and things like this. So uh, I hope you know um, that, that it will not be too much boring for you. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge my group of students without whom the work would not be possible and also the uh, various agencies that made the work uh, work possible. So I will start with the general context and then brief introduction to structural health monitoring, overall research objective, researching on global structural health monitoring, on integrity monitoring, few words on visualization, and then conclusions. So <clears throat> the motivation for the work in structural health monitoring is actually the state of US infrastructure, which is actually rather uh, not in good shape. So we see that we have mostly C's and D's um, in virtually every infrastructure, and that the cost to um, um, refurbish the infrastructure or to rebuild new is quite quite high, and it rises, you know, year after year. So this is the uh, I should have updated actually this slide because we have new uh, report from 2017. But this report is made by American Society of Civil Engineers, who every four years uh, do this evaluation of the state of the infrastructure. So, estimated uh, money, uh, you know, to, to refurbish the infrastructure is about 3.6 trillion, and about half of it goes for the uh, transportation, surface tra sur for transportation only, and the funding gap is about 1.6 trillion, and again, half of it is for the surface transportation. So, uh, American Society of Civil Engineers evaluated that if it don't do anything, it will be actually very dramatic. So, we'll have increase of costs by uh, 2040 for 350 percent and we might lose around uh, 400,000 jobs nationwide. So what is the structural health monitoring and how this can help? So structural health monitoring is a process aimed at providing accurate and in-time and actionable information concerning structural health condition and performance. So the key words here to understand is that it is a process. It's something that, is, that should be ongoing. Uh, it should be accurate, it should be in-time, and it should provide uh, actionable information. So how it is made? Uh, you instrument the structure with the sensors, various types of the sensors. It could be strain sensors, it could be accelerometers, it could be camera images nowadays. So there is really uh, a large variety of the sensors that you can use. Then you measure and record important parameters over time. And then you analyze collected data and you transform the data into the information that is useful for the structural managers. Okay, so these data should actually tell you something about performance of the structure and the structural health condition. So now the key uh, the, the, the key uh, uh, challenge here is how you actually make transformation of the data into the information. So how you make it work so that you know the, the, the person who has to make decision uh, can actually do it based on the results from monitoring that you have. So what are the structural health monitoring promising, ben uh, promising benefits? So, uh, oops, sorry, I went too fast. So the first one is to increase the safety because the structure will not, not, not collapse. Uh, second, it, it can help find hidden reserves uh, in structures that are, for example, like this bridge that we have here. It's an old structure, so the question is, uh, what is the real capacity of the structure? And by monitoring, you can you can you can know it. Increase the knowledge. We are using new materials. You're you're using new structural systems, so you want to verify your hypothesis and to see how those new structural systems and materials behave over time. You want to perform post-event evaluation. You have an earthquake, tsunami, uh, terrorist act. So something happened in a larger area and you want to check the structures around. Uh, then uh, you can better manage the, the current infrastructure and save the money because you can do the time intervention on the structures that are really in the need of the, of the repair or replacement. You can limit adverse impact to society. So if uh, you, know, you live on the Roosevelt Island and you want to go somewhere else, you have to cross the river. And if the metro tunnel is broken or the bridge is broken, you cannot do it. Uh, you want to be sustainable, to interfere as least as possible with the nature, so to use minimum amount of materials, and you can do it with the timely intervention. And finally, to be resilient uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in general. So, what is the challenge of monitoring? So, frequently when I speak about monitoring, people say, oh yeah, of course, you put the sensors you measure and you get all the results you want. But the thing is that it, it's not really what happens in real life. So, so civil structures and infrastructure, they are kind of difficult thing to really fully understand. So what we want to do, we want to detect the damage, and that would be called level one structural health monitoring. So I just want to know if the structure has some defect or not. Then 
if it has the effect, I would like to know where the effect is. I would like to know how big it is. And now I would like to know uh, what does it mean for the structure. Is the structure, you know, in, in bad shape, in truly bad shape? Is it just minor thing that I can just live with? And, and so on. So in the real life, damage detection is actually relatively difficult. It's possible, but it's yet not so easy to do it. Localization is even more challenging. The quantification, inferring the size of the damage, could be a headache. And finally, finding, you know, what is the structural performance, given that you know what is the damage state of the structure, it's something that requires you to do the numerical modeling of the structure. Structure can be complicated. Modeling damage is not easy, so, so this is really a task that is quite, quite difficult. So the goal of my research here is to, to, you know, I focus mostly on the strain sensors. And here I don't say that the strain sensors solve all the problems, right? So in order to really instrument the structure properly, you have to think about all the potential problems that can happen on the structure, and then choose the sensors that are suitable for this, whether they are def deformation sensors, they are accelerometers, can be temperature sensors, you might want to have the weather station next to it, and so on and so on. So here I focus mostly to the strain sensors, and I'm trying to see what we can do with the strain sensors, what, is, what, what we can actually achieve. So why I use the strain? So the strain, we know that material fails when we reach the strength of the material, right? And this is why what we like to do, we, 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 we do design of our structures based on the stress, right? But however, the issue is that we cannot measure the stress in the real life conditions. So there is no stress sensor. This thing does not exist for the real application. You know, if I were to go to the bridge here, I cannot do it. So what I will do, I will actually try to monitor the strain because I know that the strain is correlated with the stress. So for example, in case of steel structure, if I can isolate mechanical strain, I can multiply it to modulus and I can get the stress and that's fine. Okay, so besides uh, strain anomalies like bowing of steel or cracking of concrete, they are early indicators of the damage. And also deformations and deflections of the structure, they are good uh, uh, you know, evaluators of the performance of the structure. So this is why, this is where the motivation for the strain comes from. So what type of the strain sensors we have? So we have two types of the sensors, discrete sensors and distributed sensors. So discrete sensors, we are probably the most familiar with those. They could be short gauge and long gauge. So the short gauge sensor could be made of, fi of fiber optics and can be made of electrical sensors. Those are the two principal technologies, and you know, I guess to a certain extent you may be familiar with the strain gauges with vibrating wires, and uh, the third one is fiber optics. So let me see. So, okay. I can see from here. So this is fiber optic sensor, this fiber optic sensor, this is actually put also vibrating wire, and this is the strain gauge. So their size is small, so short. So they could be a few millimeters, you know, a little bit longer. Uh, I will not enter into detail how you can make distinction between those and the long gauge sensors that are actually enabled only by fiber optic technologies. So long gauge sensor is the sensor that has a longer length. So, you know, it could be, you know, half meter long, it could be up to 10 meters long. So it depends on the application that you want to use it. And then we come to distributed sensors that can be uh, either continuous or quasi distributed. And we have 1D continuous sensors that are, again, fiber optics. So those are essentially the cables that are sensitive in every single point along the length of the cable. So now you can imagine that if you have a you know, structure that is very large, for example, I want to monitor this frame here, what I can do, I can just stick the cable all around the frame and I can get the strain in every single point of that cable with a single shot. And then there is another type of the sensor that is currently under development and this is called uh, uh, sensing, sensing sheets based on larger electronics where we have 2D sensors that are fitted with the sensor, 2D uh, 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 um, sheet that is fitted with the sensors. So it looks a little bit like a sensing wallpaper that you can, again, attach to the structure and measure larger areas of the structure. So I will mostly focus on these three. And actually, I will go rather through the, instead of going through the theory or something like this, I will rather go just through the application and show what is possible to do with, with those technologies. So. <clears throat> Two things that are possible is that by using the long gauge sensors, we can actually do something that I like to call uh, global structural health monitoring. And using distributed sensor, we can do something that I like to call uh, integrity monitoring. So let's first see the global structural health monitoring. So the main idea here is that in monitoring, we have the same or similar approach as we have it in finite element modeling. So what I will do now, I will divide strategically my structure into the parts and I will call them cells. And here you can see some division, for example, of the piles of the column of the deck. 
And then what I will do next, I will instrument each cell with the topology of sensor that the best describes the strain field within this cell. So for example, in the piles, you mostly expect compression, sometimes tension. So simple topology should, should be sufficient. In the, this type of the column, you may have the bending because this is balanced until every bridge. So if you have the load on one side, it will bend. And then you need two sensors to distinguish bending and axial forces. And you can repeat this topology wherever you have the bending. And then in the areas where you have excessive shear, you might add cross sensors to get the shear. And in the area where you have excessive relative displacement, you can get triangular topology to get the vertical displacement. So once you did this, you can use algorithms to connect all these cells. And by connecting those cells, you will get the global behavior of the structure. So for example, by proper measurements here, I can maybe get the future state of the structure that might look something like this. OK. So, <clears throat> so this kind of approach is actually enabled by long gauge sensors. So let's see why long gauge sensors. So what is, what is the advantage of having something long as opposed to having something which is, which is really small? So first, um, you know, when I, when, I, when I try to explain this, the best way to do it maybe is just to ask you, okay, if you have a, let's say you have a column of concrete, which is meter by meter, to make life easier, and I put force of one kilonewton in this cube of, the, of this material uh, uh, now, so what will be the stress that I have in the cross section in the middle? So obviously because I asked how big is one over one, you know that there is a trick there, right? And the trick is very simple. The trick is that the average value is one, but the cross section consists of aggregate, cement paste, and cement paste may be real cement paste, or could be pore, and this pore could be with water or without water. So depending on where you are in the cross section, you'll, you'll see actually different stress, and obviously different strain that is correlated. But how we design the structures? We use actually the average value, right? When you do the crushing test of the concrete, you don't really look for the stress in every single point. What you take, you take the average value. You take your force divided by the area of the cross-section, and this is your stress that, that is inside. So if you use short sensors, the short sensor will be actually heavily influenced by proximity of the aggregate, of the void, of the you know, material that is next to it. But if you use long sensor, what you will do, you will do exactly the same average. So in the information that you get from there is the information that you actually use when you design the structures, and it is information that is useful for you to understand what is the structural behavior. So we have a long sensor, we have some discontinuity along, and what our sensor will give us is essentially sum of two components, strain component, wherever you have continuous material, and you have the change in dimension of discontinuities wherever you have the crack or the void or, or, or things like this. Okay, so those are these two components. So this average value is actually quite, quite useful and helps us do the, 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 the work. So now, what are the advantages? First, measurement is insensitive to local material defects. So it gives us the global behavior of the material. And second, because it is longer, it has larger special coverage, so it is more likely to attack the damage. So if you even take the simply supported beam and you put the load in the middle of the beam, and I ask you, okay, where the beam will break, you will say in the middle. And now I will ask you, okay, middle is one point. Is it exactly that point, or is it slightly left or right from that point? Obviously, it will depend on the local defects in the material. If you have short sensors, you may miss it. If you have long sensor, you will cover it, and definitely you will have it in your interval. So those are the advantages of, and this is why we use the long gauge sensors. So now I'll show you a couple of examples, what we did in real life. So before I do it, I want just, you know, everyone here has fancy shapes to show on the, on the you know, on the presentation. I'm pretty sure looking at the titles of the speakers after me, it will be the same. So I also prepared something fancy, which I didn't do, but someone else did it. And this is my testing lab. So we are in the building called the bridge. And this is on Princeton campus, the bridge, which is actually a bridge. And this is my lab. This is where I have the sensors. So just to understand the complexity of this bridge, you can see a couple of views. So it is dex and arch over the main span. But if you look at from the top, you see that there is kind of X, uh, uh, decks that are meeting in the middle. And if you approach the bridge from one side, this is what you see. But if you continue going underneath the bridge, this is the view that you will have. So, so this is the structure that they use to test the methods that, that were developed in my lab. And obviously, nothing would be possible without the people who installed it, which are the students. And so this guy here will actually show me my timing here. So this is Dan Reilus, who was, who was a, a 
uh, NFC student at Princeton University, and there is another one working for TNT. Uh, this is how he started, and now he is in this company here. Okay, so uh, let's see what we did. So first thing we did is the research on the neutral axis. For those who are less familiar, but I guess every engineer should know that neutral axis is a set of points in the cross section a plane where normal stress and strain are equal to zero. So if we have, this is longitudinal view, if we have moment and normal force, then in 2D we get a point essentially. An important thing to say is that in the absence of the normal force, uh, this point will, be, will happen to be in the center of the, of the, of the stiffness of the cross section. So now, when I started working on this, it was really by chance, I said to my student, oh, quickly find the neutral axis and then we will continue with that what we wanted to do. The challenge with this was that actually neutral axis is not so easy to find in real life. And the reason for this is that because, you know, if the neutral axis is not at the location where you think it should be, it could be damaged in the cross section, but also it could be changing the axial force, right? You see it immediately here from the drawing. It could be biaxial bending and you assume uniaxial bending. Uh, it could be changing the temperature. It could be rheologic strain, like creep and shrinkage happening in concrete, or it could be simply low magnitude of strain so you don't have enough sensitivity when you're doing this. So we figured out that it's actually quite challenging to find the location of the neutral axis in the real life. And we thought that it would be very important to be able to do this. So if you want to find the damage, you would like to find the change in the location of the neutral axis, but the challenge is how to distinguish unusual from those normal behaviors that will change the location of the neutral axis. So uh, what we did, we applied to the Straker Bridge, and in the Straker Bridge, you saw before, students embedded sensors in the concrete. Locations of the sensors are shown in this, uh, in this image here. So we have, uh, we covered uh, maximum negative bending moments, we covered maximum positive bending moments, and then we covered some inflection points that was also very important, where you don't expect any damage to happen. And then there was a joint between all the new concrete here, so we have a little bit more sensors to that location. So the, the deck stiffened arch was built in August, and the, the southeast leg and the other legs were built in October. So we have difference also in the quality of the concrete. So what we had in this structure, actually, we were able, the first thing we were able to do, we were able to detect the early age cracks that happened due to the thermal actions in the bridge. And they started from the location of maximum positive bending moment, and then they just propagated. Uh, and later on, a couple of days later, we had another crack happening here on the joint that was caused but unusually, by unusually uh, high temperature at the time. So if you observe a simple diagram from those measurements, we can see here that uh, we have early age, so we have the swelling of the concrete with the hydration, we have the uh, shortening of the concrete with the cooling down and the intermediate shrinkage, then we have the crack formation here, then we have the post tension of the concrete, so with the post tension of the crack is probably closed, and then we see the normal evolution here with the form of the water cabin in this location here. So you see that we can actually follow clearly the history of the material and the history of structure uh, as we go through the uh, as we go through the life of the structure. So next, what we try to do with the neutral axis is say, okay, this is pre-stress structure, and we have creep and shrinkage ongoing all the time. So how we can actually find the location of the neutral axis? So what we, what we wanted to do is we say, okay, let's observe the moment when the form were removed because this is when you activate the dead load and there is no reason in that case for axial force to change dramatically. So this will be our, our, our test. So for removal, you can see it here when you zoom onto the diagram, you can see the changes in upper and lower sensor. And then <clears throat> that's what we got. It was actually very interesting. So um, we would expect a neutral axis. So I'm not sure if this one is on. It seems to be on, but I can question. I underneath the value that we expect to have. And this happens systematically in every single cross-section. So now, the dilemma was, okay, if, okay, thanks. Okay. So now the dilemma was, if we have complete bridge with the centroid of the stiffness lower, what happens with, it, with the bridge? I mean, that something, is, something is unusual there. 
So we were thinking a lot about what happens here, and then if you observe the cross-section of the bridge, what we see, we see that we actually have the voids, so those circles here are voids, uh, in which there is no concrete. So there are embedded pipes inside to make the structure lighter. So, uh, so we notice that there is high width to depth ratio. It reminds us on the T-sections in concrete structures and the effectiveness of the T-section. So we actually tested hypothesis that the, that the cross-section behaves as a T-section and actually we found that this is the true. We found all the correspondence with the cause that we found. And we also, because in one section we had the third sensor here, we also compared with the third sensor that was theoretically above the second sensor and we saw that it measures less than it should be, so that means we had our confirmation. So this, 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 show, this you know, experiment so far shown that we are able to find that something is unusual in structure and we were able to quantify it and we were able to give the information about structural safety uh, in this case. So the other things that we did, and I will go very, very quickly across this, is, is to, um, to find the form shape by double integration of the curvature. So we developed the full method to not only find, to do, I mean, doing double integration is no big deal, but that's what is big deal is finding the error of this double integration in real life settings, and we were able to do this and compare it uh, through the test of the bridge. Then we were able to evaluate the pre-stress force, and we were able actually to find some unusual behaviors in the anchorage of the pre-stress force. So we found that the pre-stress force is slightly lower than it should be at some locations. And then also I mentioned the cracks that we had before. And for those cracks, we were able to evaluate to what extent they were closed through the post-tensioning step by step. And we found that they are actually practically closed. So there is no any issue with the bridge uh, at this moment. Okay, so <clears throat> here I show you just illustration of what we can do with the sensors in understanding of structural behavior. So we don't monitor uh, structures, you know, a lot, which means many of those things probably happens in virtually every structure you build, but you just don't know because you don't have the sensors. So it's very important to have the sensors, in my opinion, to actually know what happens with the structures. Okay, so now uh, I will quickly jump this slide because it's too much. So don't look at it, but I have, sh I, I'm running a little bit out of time. So. Let's move to distributed sensors. I mentioned before, the idea here is to have the sensor that is in form of cable that covers the whole structure. Why is this? Because if you have just discrete sensors, if the damage happens between the sensors, you might not be you know, good in evaluating and finding this, this damage. So typically, if you have a structure, you cover it with the sensor. If you have the damage happening, what will happen? You'll have the shift in the strain diagram, but you'll definitely see the damage as a jump uh, at the location of the damage. And that was tested actually at Cornell University. So this is kind of good connection with the, with the bridge building here. Uh, so we embedded some uh, pipes and we tested, the, we, we glued the sensor over the pipe. So you can see it in the image in the middle, different distributed sensors that were glued. And then we moved the soil in order to break the pipe. And we're trying to see if we can find the damage and actually we're able to find the damage both on the pipe and in the soil very, very reliably. So this sensor actually works more or less as a nervous system. So you know, you have a nerve all the way in your arm, wherever you get, you know, wounded, you exactly know where it is and you know uh, how, big, uh, how big the wound is. And then uh, another example is again the Straker Bridge. So we have also distributed sensor embedded in the Straker Bridge and those are the location of ordinary sensor, distributed is in blue. So what we could do, we could actually compare our discrete sensors and distributed sensors through the process of the cracking of the concrete and pre-stressing and we found some discrepancy that I will not enter into detail now, but the important thing was that we were able with the distributed technology also to very well detect the damage and to very well detect that the damage was removed by the post-tensioning of the bridge. Okay, so now you cannot solve everything in 1D, right? Sometimes you need solutions in 2D. And in, for this, what I am doing now is developing distributed sensor, as I mentioned before, that can be used as a wallpaper glued over the you know, large areas of the structures. How it works, you start with the unit sensor, you print the unit sensor over a flexible polymide sheet in multiple uh, uh, arrangement. Then you add integrated circuits that are essentially small computers that do you know, reading of the sensor, they do the processing, so you do the data analysis actually on the structure itself, not in your office, uh, and they do also the power management and communication. So power management is because you can print the batteries also on the sheet and then you can have the, the whatever power harvesting device to, to just feed the, the sheet. 
So then you cover the sheet with, with protective layer and whatever shape of your structure is, you can actually install it on the structure because it's conformable and you can cut out the parts that you don't need in order to fit the shape. And now, if every integrated circuit controls groups of the sensor and the damage occurs, what you will be able to do, you will be able to see all the sensors that are activated by the damage and uh, obviously the integrated cir circuit will see it because they read the sensor, they will communicate to each other, infer the size of the damage and finally communicate it to the office and tell you, hey, there is something happening on the bridge at that location with this size. So what you can do, you can either put it in the final event model to see uh, what is the state of your structure or you can simply go visit the structure and with your eye see the size of the damage and then proceed with, it, with, with whatever you want to do later on. So <clears throat> we did a lot of tests that I will skip now. I think the one that is interesting, we did the probability of damage detection, but the one that is interesting is this one where we actually made the prototype of the sheet, glue it to the steel specimen, expose the steel specimen to the fatigue loading, and we we're looking how the crack is propagating here. And actually, we we're able to see that sensors that are in contact will fail, and this will be our indication of the damage, and the sensors that are not in the contact will relax, and that would be also indication of the damage. So we we're quite able to follow the you know, occurrence and then propagation of the damage, so we were able to see the size and so on. So current state of this research is that we installed the sensor on the Straker bridge, and now we are monitoring it, comparing with fiber optics. Uh, we still have to do some work on this, so it's not, it's not perfect yet, but it is something that is really ongoing. Okay, so one thing I wanted to show you here, it's a little bit of uh, virtual reality uh, applied for the visualization of the data. So this is the bridge, and uh, we wanted to see how we can, because we, all this information that you saw so far, it's quite rich. You have distributed sensor, you have discrete sensor, you have sensing sheet, we find the form shape, we measure locations, and so on and so on. And we thought that virtual reality could be a very interesting way to actually integrate all together. Uh, I will probably not run all the video, but just to show you, so you can be on the structure, the image that is to the left, your right, sorry, uh, you don't know your left, is showing you what you are seeing uh, currently. You can click on the hotspots, you'll be, you'll be at a certain location, you can see the sensors, you can see both data and metadata, and the way, that what I call metadata are essentially structural drawings. Uh, legend tells you if the sensor is functional, non-functional, disconnected. Uh, Symbol tells you if it's temperature of the strain, so you can click on the sensor, get the strain uh, the temperature diagram. You can click on the cross section and get the properties of the cross section. Um, uh, what else we have here? Yes, you can click on the sensor and you can get connected to the to the cloud and get the data from the cloud if you want, and then you can export the data and do something with the data if, if you want some further analysis or not. Uh, so I think I'm slightly running out of time, so maybe I will. Um, uh, just okay. So here you see the diagrams um, of the drawings of the of the structure. So let me just continue with the with the conclusion slides. So what I presented here are long gauge uh, fiber optic sensors, distributed fiber optic sensors, and large electronic sensing sheets as new tools for evaluation of the structures. And we saw that we have paradigm change. We transformed the way we can assess the strain from real structures. So we are moving from the small strain gauges to different type of the sensor that actually can give us global behavior of the structure opposed to really local material behavior. Okay, so then uh, with the global structure health monitoring and with integrity structure health monitoring, what we can do, we can actually have, oh, again, paradigm change. We transform the way we can assess structure health condition and performance on real structures and enable universal methods. So when I spoke before, I mentioned neutral axis, but you know, neutral axis is specific to any beam structure. So this is the method that you apply to anywhere you have the beams, you can apply that method. You know, integrity monitoring, it detects basically as your skin detects, you know, the, 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 the scratches or the wounds. So it can again be universally applied to any type of the structure. Is it this beam or is it the one on that bridge here or, or some other, you know, beam structure? It can work everywhere. And finally, if we have universal methods and we have validations in real life settings, which I shown here, we can actually have more widespread use of structure health monitoring because we enable this level four monitoring where we provide information for the owner of the structure so he can act upon it. Uh, and so we come to my vision, which is actually to have ubiquitous and pervasive deployment of structure health monitoring. So you can have the city which is monitored, right? You can know exactly where the pain is in the city and you can transform the way the structures are built, used, um, managed, uh, how to make post-event mitigation efforts and you can contribute to sustainability and resilience. 
which means you can profoundly transform our built environment uh, through structural health monitoring. So if uh, we say society is the spirit of the city and infrastructure is the body of the city, hopefully structural health monitoring can remove the pain and we can follow you know, a healthy society and a healthy infrastructure. Okay, so the last slide is just a comment of designer of the Straker Bridge and this comment was made some 30 years before the bridge was built, so it's Christian Mann who says bridges are powerful reflections of both the state of the technological development and of the intellectual climate at the time of their construction. And I think, you know, that what he stated some 30 years ago is obviously visible and valid uh, still today. Okay, with this, thank you very much. Thank you.